his, his outlook really fueled my passion and to inspire me not to live a practical life and kind of make decisions based on staying true to myself and doing, you know, not just taking a job because it's better money, but doing something that would be harder maybe to, to achieve. Um, and I intend to find work in this way, um, by building drums or something of the sort in the future. Because I know uh, music is a universal language that I want to connect with people with, and I think this is just um, a really good way. So, let's talk about the drum building process. That's, what, that's the best part. Um, after this black walnut tree was cut down by an arborist that Dan knows, um, I, also, I have to put this in, I always said grind never stops. That was like my catchphrase, so all my friends made fun of me for it, but it was still funny because I would just send them snapshots every day and it'd just be grind never stops, and it's just ridiculous. <laughs> but I thought it was funny. <laughs> um, this consisted of around 300 hours of work to make these four drums. A little bit less than that, but around 300, which is really, you know, it shows how much work is put into musical instruments. Sometimes that's half the deal, half the, the creativity and what music is, is building what you make it out of. Um, and it really can inspire you, just the sounds you get. Um, so some days this work was mostly, like I said, coming in and sanding, getting straight to work. And some days it would be, I learned something new about the different joint I had to make, or um, the right mixtures to make to press it the right way, or stuff like that. Um, instead of to become an expert in this in the field, it has to take 10,000 hours of practice. So I still have a lot of work to do, obviously. Um, but, um, yeah, I have another picture here. So that's after we got it cut down. These are the chunks we got to work with. There's a slab. There's three slabs on the ground, and then one laying up against the the shed. Um, so first, we use. I learned how to use a planer, which is that thing on the left or the right. Um, and that's that's what the the wood looked like after after we planed it to see the curl and to see the design on each plank, so we could determine which drums would be for which planks we'd use. Um, so that was, that was really cool and you know we had to actually use math to determine the diameter of what each drum was going to be and you know um, so I did do some math in there. <laughs> um, uh, yeah I wanted a jazz style kit which is what this is because um, I had a standard kit and I wanted some with more personality on them. So these are smaller than typical standard dimensions so it's a 14 inch diameter snare drum, 18 inch uh, kick drum. This high tom is 10 inch and then the low tom is 14 inch. Um, so I just wanted, there's more um, kind of tonality in a smaller smaller drum set and you can tune it better, you can tune it to more specific what you want. Um, sometimes, yeah this is kind of a cool part, we stop and listen in the mid middle of you know cutting the slab into a plank or something, we listen to the song that was playing because Dan had a lot of influences. and. Besides just drum building, he helped me with so much just musical genius. You know, he's a, I think he's a musical genius. He would just stop and like pin, be able to pinpoint every little thing in the song and tell me how it's done or how people have done that and the history of drums and drummers and um, music in general. Um, so he's, he's really good about that kind of stuff, which really helped me learn even more. Um, yeah, this backyard had some of the coolest vibes. Like I said, this was what the shed looked like. Very organized, there's a chicken looking at me. <laughs> Don't remember that one's name, but... <laughs> um, yeah, he was just really, really chill. I could walk back to his house at any time. And just being an apprentice really helped me realize, or it helped me look into his life like really closely, almost follow what he does, and see how I could get to that point one day. Um, yeah, so we cut the wood in specific planks in the drums. Um, and then I learned all about scarf joints, which is what I passed out, what they're not supposed to look like. But um, these joints um, were basically you sanded down an edge of the plank once you had the full plank cut out. And you, after it was bent, you could be able to fit the shaved down joint to the other side of the, the drum so it could fit in round. Um, so we always over calculated a little bit in case, you know, we'd rather have it too long than too short of a drum where it doesn't fit in the desired mold. Um, so this is what they were supposed to look like, and you can kind of see those. I have another example of a better one, if you want to pass that around just to see it on the end. 
Um, so that's kind of generally what a plank looked like. It was a lot longer than that, obviously, but that's what the scarf joint looked like. Um, so after um, these were done, each plank was done, it was really the hardest part probably was bending the shells. Um, so it had to sit, once you had a, a plank, you had to sit in this steam pipe for uh, 30 minutes, sometimes like an hour, depending how thick the wood was. There's around a quarter inch thickness to half inch thickness for each plank um, because it had to soften in this steam and we had a steam box that would hook up to the steam pipe and all the heat would be generated directly to the pipe. Um, so after it was sat there for a while you had to take it out and as quickly as you could try to fit it into whatever diameter mold we were using. So for the snare we did first we did a 14 inch. So I had to cram this somewhat soft um, wood and it was really cool to be able to actually physically bend the wood with my hands and then cram in this wood and I probably looked really ridiculous trying to fit the pieces in like that. It was like really weird. I wish I had a video of the whole thing. Um, but in order to get it somewhat in round we had to take it out um, and we put it in this, it was a concrete uh, kind of circular slab and we roll it in metal. I have a picture here. Not that. Yeah we roll it if you can see this, the concrete thing with the metal thing kind of wrapped around it. Um, we had to put the plank where the metal is and the concrete meet and then roll it physically. And it would be super hot against the metal. So I'd start to burn my hand or my knees or whatever was pressing against it. So that was just super hard. It didn't seem like that should be how you build a drum set. You know, it seems too like unethical almost. Um, so we fit in that mold as you can see right there. That's what the mold looked like initially. Um, and sometimes it, it wouldn't come out completely perfectly round, obviously. <coughs> so we'd have to clamp it like that, and we'd have a little bit extra. But sometimes they would end up looking like that because <laughs> we'd had to, some pieces were stick out too much. I guess a little kind of funny because we'd use a heat gun sometimes if it wasn't perfectly being around and forcefully do it. So a lot of forces involved in the, the bending. Um, and like I said, we overcalculated, so I'd use. Um, this Japanese saw to cut off ends so they would meet the desired, so the scarf joints would meet perfectly rather than too short or just way too long. So I cut off the excess that we calculated for. Um, so that was kind of fun. Um, after it was bent, uh, we had used another um, scarf joint on the other side, which scarf joints took a long time. Many days it was just hot sun beating down on me and I had to sit there and try to sand this thing. Um, and Dan would just, you know, be sitting in the shade like, hey, you good? And, you know, just drinking <laughs> water or something. It's just a kind of funny thing. But, um, which, but this time I got to use a spindle sander because it's, you know, a circle. So that did a lot of the work for me, but I had to still uh, remember the focus and I couldn't indent it too much because I have some weird, weird scarf joint extras that I used that were just like in and out and like not even remotely what it was supposed to be. Um, so, so was, there was conscious thought involved when I was sanding, even though it took most of the time. Um, so the next step, to my surprise, uh, Dan told me to go pick out a fabric for the inside of the drums. And you can see them after I'm done, you can look at the inside. But uh, that was kind of a funny experience because I didn't picture myself the very next day going to Joanne's fabric and <laughs> standing in line with all these grandmas talking about their quilts. And, their <laughs> and, and I was, you know, design, I was like, yeah, I'm using this for, to build drums, and they were super intrigued by that and asking all these questions and stuff. But that was, that was a really, really funny experience. Put me out of my conversation. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so I picked out a pattern that I liked, and after a while, I spent a while there to try to find the right one, I picked this. Nope. I picked this. I think the ET really stands out. Makes <laughs> it, you know, very unique. No, I was kidding. I picked this one, <laughs> which is a little better looking, more acceptable. Um, <laughs> it uh, it made the wood, the dark, the dark brown wood, look really pop and just look almost more modern in a way. And I really like that one. So, um, yeah, that was really. I even thought about picking this one at the time. <laughs> Because, you know, back to my childhood roots playing Mario or something. But I thought that was a really cool design. Um, yeah, so we, lay, we had to lay this fabric in as flat as possible. And we couldn't use, you know, some strong held glue because it would be too much of a, um, of a bump kind of in the inside. So I had to use this really cheap spray type glue and then try to lay it, 
lay it all in evenly. I have a picture up here. Yeah. Um, so Dan showed me how to do it, and then he would take it off and then let me do it. And it was a lot harder than you might think trying to let, let it sit there, because it wouldn't stay very well. And I had to try to, if I pushed any part of it, it all fall off, which took a while. But the bottom picture, you can see it, it did work. Um, uh, yeah, so <laughs> that was really tough. Um, next time I do this, I'll make sure to really flatten it like perfectly. Take a lot more time to do that because um, it makes it look a lot better for sure. Um, so in order to press the shells, if we had multiple planks, we'd use this type of glue mixture, which is used on skis and snowboards and surfboards and stuff. Uh, so it's like all weatherproof, which is really nice in case I want to. You know, go swimming with my drum or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it's a really good thing to have. <laughs> um, um, so we mix these, and we had to make this contraption that consisted that right picture uh, consisted of four hundred thousand pounds of pressure, which may not look like it, but that's just Dan's had students in the past where. Um, you, you make this contraption and it just blows up and all the pieces go everywhere. And luckily that didn't happen to me, which is really didn't set me back at all and I had enough time. Um, and then the inside, we'd, we'd blow up a, a ball, an exercise ball to keep it as in round as we could. Um, so all the pieces are clamped down, which contain a lot of pressure. And we use the compressor uh, for the exercise ball once it was inside. Um, so we'd sit for maybe a few days, 